science um, about the uh, insights section, which is the part that I um, edit in particular, and also the tips that I've learned over the years about writing. So I'm hopefully um, going to be able to tell you about, um, hopefully you'll be able to use what I tell you to apply to submissions to other journals as well, and they're kind of, you know, general, general rules, as it were. So science um, has a digital circulation of about 125,000. We have about seven and a half million page views per month at the sciencemag.org website. We have over half a million unique visitors per week. And many of our visitors come from social media. So science has a very active Twitter account with over a million followers and over three, uh, three million fans on Facebook. Um, science is not um, a journal on its own. There are five sister journals as well. There's Science Signaling, Science Translational Medicine, Science Robotics, Science Immunology, as well as the open access journal, Science Advances. So it's a, a, a suite of six journals. And we're all published Association for the Advancement of Science. And it's um, one of the world's biggest science organizations. It's founded in 1848. It's non-profit, which means that all the journals function in a non-profit way. Um, and it serves about 10 million people, either through memberships, through affiliations, or through uh, the scientific, scientific societies and academies that are affiliated with AAAS. Um, the mission of AAAS is basically to bring science to as many people as possible. So science in the eyes of AAAS has no borders. So the idea is that uh, AAAS is involved in communicating science uh, through science policy, and also through promoting science in education, uh, promoting diversity in science, as well as um, careers um, for scientists. Um, it's, it's similar in many ways to other journals, but it does have some unique points. So uh, all authors can post the accepted version of their article on their websites or on institutional repositories. So, that means that the version that you submit that becomes accepted, so before it is processed by copy editing or um, turns into you know, the beautiful articles we produce as PDFs, before that point, uh, once accepted, you can um, post your articles for free. All articles are free after 12 months once they've been published. Um, all authors can have a link where they can post this on their website um, where people can access their papers for free. Um, all authors pay only a small part of the publication costs. Um, the rest of the costs are met through subscriptions as well as non-subscriptions, which is uh, through access to individual. Articles, great vast um, number of topics, and that includes earth sciences, physics, chemistry, we're trying to improve our biomedicine and translational uh, medicine um, coverage, as well as lots of cell biology development and biochemistry and all that kind of thing. And there are editors that sit in each one of these topics or more than one editor that covers e uh, each one of these topics. So we have 25 in total at the journal and they'll have their own. own special submissions. Um, the submissions report or a research article which can be in print or online. The online versions tend to be much longer so there's quite a lot of flexibility at the journal for the types of articles and the lengths of articles that we can publish. Um, Science operates with a board of reviewing editors who are recruited by editors to work for the journal and so there is a two-stage assessment process and the first, first round of assessment means that um, an article is assessed by editors and members of the board of reviewing editors and then if that that round is successful uh, the paper will move on to external expert reviewers for official peer review um, if that is successful there is likelihood that um, a statistics board of reviewing editors someone from there will be recruited and of of the 11,000 submissions approximately eight percent or less are eventually accepted Chart. This kind of summarizes the 
the workflow that we use for manuscript assessment. So a manuscript is submitted, almost all of those are evaluated by editors as well as members of the board of reviewing editors and obviously we choose members based on their expertise and what the the topics the article covers um, every article is assigned one primary editor and then additional editors also look at that paper if um, it is relevant for them so as most as science is increasingly multidisciplinary it tends to be that uh, we need multiple editors with multiple different um, expertise to look at a, look at a paper in the same way we do with reviewers. Um, that process takes about one to two weeks. From that point, there will be an editorial assessment based on feedback from members of the board as well as other editors. And about 75% of those 11,000 submissions are rejected at that stage. 25% go on for external review. And that's where we recruit at least two, um, if not more, um, experts in the field uh, who can assess the manuscript. Um, and those experts, I will talk to you a bit more about how we choose those, but basically they're there to assess the stringency of the, of the data and how the data support the conclusion. Um, based on the response from the reviewers, the editors will evaluate what they want to do next, and they'll either ask for a revision or there will be a rejection. It's about 8%. Um, as I said before, that are accepted eventually. If your paper is accepted, then editors edit it and give advice about how it's organized, what figures should be where, what should be supplementary, all that kind of thing, before it goes on to copy editing and, and ultimately to publication. Kind of these are the important points um, that a journal like Science is looking for. Um, the papers need to bring a, a significant advance in scientific understanding. Um, so there really needs to be a substantial um, conceptual innovation or present new synthesis or new data that, that changes the way we think, that really um, is surprising or is significant in terms of how we think about whatever the paper is about. Um, it needs to have broad interest because science has such a substantial um, audience and, and because it's part of AAAS, this, our audience is not just scientists, it's also uh, members of the public with an interest in science, science policy makers, there's a, there's a hugely diverse audience. So we need to make sure that our content is as appealing and as widely interesting as we can. So it needs to be appropriate for the community within which your paper sits, but also beyond. And obviously there also needs to be high technical quality. And what we mean by that is that the, the data strongly support the conclusions um, and the interpretation. To science, and in fact, you could think about this in for other journals as well. Um, why does your paper belong in the journal you're submitting to. For science, we're looking for a big step forward and broad implications. Uh, multidisciplinary science is something we're very keen on. Um, so much good science involves huge teams, often international. Um, we also look for new techniques. So you're using something, have you found a, a technique that vastly changes how we go about something? And does this lead you to new conclusions about what you're looking at? Um, we also look at, you know, there's also, you know, does your paper fit within the format of science? Science has huge flexibility on article types, but it's also important to make sure that your paper, uh, that you think your paper will fit. Uh, and will be appropriate. Think about how you, how you would assess that your article if you were an editor. Try to take a step back and critically appraise your work. So think about your paper in terms of are there good reasons to reject the paper? If you were the editor of the journal, how would you feel about receiving your paper? What would, you, what would be the, the, the reasons to proceed and what would be the re reasons to reject? How would you convince your editors, your colleagues to go with the, with the paper? What's the value of it? Think about these things and then ask yourself if you're submitting to the correct journal. Um, it's also very important to think about um, uh, 
journal scope? Does your paper fit within the topics and the types of papers that the journal submits um, and publishes? And also think about whether your paper is competitive. Does it, um, does it sit nicely with the other papers that are published? Is it along the, line, the lines of quality and um, substantial advances and wide appeal as other papers that you see? Do you see papers that are in your field in the journal that you think your paper would sit nicely next to? Step back about and think about if you were reviewing the paper, um, do you think it would be interesting enough for a science journal? Um, how would you feel about it if you see it published? Would you go, wow, this is amazing. I really want to talk to my lab about this. Or would you do the opposite and um, criticize the editors and wonder what on earth they were thinking? Try to be as, as critical of yourself as you can. Research is really important. Is the approach original? Are the data reproducible? Always check your statistics. Make sure that there are proper statistics made um, on the results. Make sure error bars are there, for example. Um, are the experiments properly controlled? Are the, is the interpretation reasonable? Or are there other interpretations that you might need to assess? Are there other controls that could rule out other interpretations? Think about how you present your data. You might have amazing data. But if people can't understand where you're coming from or the logic of how you're presenting um, or about how the logic of how you're going about your experiments, then it will be very difficult to see through them. So think about um, how you describe your data. Make sure that you describe things carefully and clearly. Keep things short and to the point. Um, try to eliminate errors if you can, but obviously this won't, this won't matter at the initial um, assessment stages, but it is important to make your data on your paper as easy to read um, and as much of a pleasure to read as possible. Um, make sure your figures are clear, that they're properly labelled, that the figure legends make sense and they explain everything in the figures. Um, and make sure that you, that you discuss other people's work that might be similar to yours or, might, or your work might build from. It is really important to ensure that you cite other people's research. Um, everyone who assesses manuscripts has access to PubMed or anything like that, so they will check. So you may as well cite them if there is uh, something you're worried about. Or explain in a cover letter why your paper is different to other papers that may seem similar. Um, and also think about the style of the journal you're submitting to. All journals have their own style and their own guidelines, and it's really important to check uh, Check those before you sub if you can. The things that science is not looking for is excessive or unfounded speculation. Um, it, it's often nice in a discussion to think about the wider implications and, and speculate about what everything could mean, but the paper shouldn't be founded um, in speculation. It should be entirely based on the data and the data need to support your conclusions. Obviously, incremental advances or repetition of things that we already know are not appropriate for a journal like Science. Um, and the most exciting conclusions need to be well supported by the, by the data rather than being, you know, this could mean this, but we haven't, we haven't quite showed it yet. So it's important to be really critical of your data and ensure that your interpretation is accurate based on the data that you have. Start to review, um, we draw on many things. So uh, editors are highly experienced, they go to conferences, they do lab visits, they've obviously handled a lot of manuscripts and so they're experienced with certain reviewers and certain authors. Um, and so we, we draw on that information to choose a an appropriate reviewer. We also have suggestions from our board of reviewing editors. When they take a look, um, look at a manuscript, they also suggest reviewers. We have uh, records on our database. So everything we do is on our online CTS um, uh, manuscript handling system. And we score all the reviewers in terms of how they do, in terms of how helpful they are. 
Um, and so those records can also inform us about whether to choose somebody. So can how often a reviewer has been used, because obviously we don't want to, one, overuse people, but also we don't want to introduce bias by overusing the same people to review manuscripts. Um, we also obviously carry out literature searches, we look at the web, we look at conferences, we look at keynote speakers, um, and we consider suggestions from the authors as well as, as well as exclusions. And we consider things like diversity, you know, how many, how many um, uh, women do we have in the reviewers, in the suite of reviewers? How many, what's the geographical uh, distribution of the reviewers? So we try to think as much as we can um, about these things when we're choosing. So we have as much of an unbiased system as we possibly can achieve. So what makes a good review? Um, what we're looking for from our peer reviewers are, is an analysis of the quality of the experiments and how they're interpreted. We want um, an analysis as well as reasons um, that explain whether you think the experiments support the conclusions. Um, we want experiments to be suggested that will help improve the conclusions that are there. We don't necessarily want suggestions that are entirely unreasonable and would take another two years um, and completely change the paper. So it actually becomes, you know, often you get reviewers who will, who will say, well, you know, it would be great if they could do this, this and this, but that would be the second paper rather than the paper that's under um, evaluation at the time. Um, it's also useful to have an idea of what the impact of the paper might be in terms of within the field as well as within the broader context. Um, obviously, any similarity of publications are important for us to know. And we also ask reviewers to comment on the presentation of the data and the discussion in the paper, whether the, whether the, whether the discussion is too general or too hyped or too positive, there's not enough critical evaluation or the caveat. That's not clear, that kind of thing. So, so our kind of uh, one of, so um, if the reviewers and editors are positive, they think the paper has real legs and it could, you know, could be a great piece for the journal, um, then we will invite revision. Now that revision could either be revised once and then go straight to accept, or that revision can be revised, do a couple more experiments that aren't major, they're not going to take months and months you know we give we give around six weeks to two months to do this um, but then we may need a second round of peer review but acceptance is highly likely on the basis of what needs to be done um, the other decision that can be made is that uh, we'll offer a, a resubmission um, and that means that we're not sure that the article can be accepted in the near term so we give up to a year for this revision, and that's because the reviewers and editors have considerable concerns um, about the paper and that multiple experiments are needed that could take a long time to do. Obviously, if an author opts for resubmission, then novelty can be compromised on the basis of other papers coming out during that year that you're revising. Um, we can also, uh, the other decision will be reject, which is the majority of our decisions. Um, and that's because uh, reviewers and editors together agree that the paper is not at a sufficiently high level for science. So that, that doesn't necessarily mean that the data aren't any good. It could potentially mostly mean that actually the, the paper would sit better in a more specialist journal rather than a journal like science that needs, you know, really massive conceptual change and broadly appealing topics. Um, so there's also, if rejection is the result, uh, authors are given the op opportunity to resubmit to a science sister journal if they choose. Um, if you get a rejection, and this applies to any journal, <laughs> if you get a rejection, um, sleep on it before you reply. I think all editors are used to um, authors being upset with them at some point in, um, in their careers. And, and I think, you know, it's totally understandable. But it really is more productive and much better if you sleep on it and wait 24 hours before um, you send an email to the to the editor who's rejected your work. Um, at Science, appeals are only granted if there is clear evidence of an error in the judgment and the decision or if bias in the decision as well. 
Um, and appeals are appeals are certainly considered, but they're very very rarely granted because we 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 put a lot of effort in making sure that we make the right decisions in the first place. And there's a lot of people involved in making those decisions. So often we feel that they are the right decisions for the journal. in publishing, especially in cancer research, but obviously other fields as well. Um, so science uh, has is a member of research standards where we have clear guidelines about citations, data, and analytic methods. We have guidelines about data deposition to ensure that everything that is published is accessible for other researchers to look at and work on. And we make sure the data are, are deposited um, in the correct place. It's available to any researcher for reproduction or for extending the analysis. So we strongly recommend that you use things like Dryad. Zenodo is particularly good for data because you can get a DOI where it's permanently um, held. All reasonable requests for data or code, all materials must be fulfilled. If you're an archaeologist or something like that, then all fossils or specimens need to be deposited somewhere public or somewhere um, that's available for other researchers. is to make sure papers are seen by the right people and that they get the um, audience that they need. So any paper that's a genomics paper or with immediate public health relevance, so for example, a paper about say Zika virus or something along those lines or Lassa virus, uh, they will be made free. Um, papers published after 97 are all free for, um, after 12 months um, of publication. All the supplementary materials are free. Authors can deposit their manuscripts in repositories um, and we provide a, a link, as I mentioned before, that everyone um, can use on their own website. Um, authors retain copyright and we also make papers that we think are particularly broadly appealing but that don't fit into those um, points above, particularly in terms of public health relevance. Um, we make those free for two weeks. as well. I publish most of my content and that's for the perspectives, policy forums, book reviews and letters. So I and I also about a third of the perspectives um, are standalone perspectives. So they're kind of two page progress reviews on emerging and important areas in biology. Um, they're not highly speculative, but they do provide kind of insight and critical evaluation of new ideas. Um, almost everything in the insight section is commissioned, but we can take proposals if people contact us. Um, the standalone type perspectives, the short reviews, are all peer reviewed either by board members only or also through external reviewers. So perspectives cover biology, but we also have a chemistry perspectives editor and a physics perspective editor. So we have a broad coverage of important topics. Four pages long, sometimes a little bit less, with multi-authors. These are our direct feed to science policy makers um, and they're all heavily reviewed. Um, if you're interested, ever interested in submitting something like that, then you can contact Brad Weeble, who's our policy forum editor. Based on the past three to five years of um, advances in the field. So we don't want to look back years and years and years. They're kind of recent advances that are important that require new synthesis. These are all peer reviewed. They're published online. They are mostly exclusively commissioned by editors, but we can take proposals from people who submit ideas. And the best way to do that, as with any journal, if you want to write a commentary or a, a review, is to submit an outline that kind of summarizes what you want to cover and the key references and um, why 
your article is important. The nuts and bolts of science works and actually, you know, lots of the things that I've said can be applied to other journals as well. But um, I also know you wanted me to talk a bit about kind of tips for writing. So my years, these are these are the, the things that I find myself saying the most. So the first thing to do, I think, before you start writing anything, whether it be a paper, a commentary or a review, is to construct an outline, figure out how you're going to organize your thoughts. And once you've done that, that will allow you to easily figure out which figures are the most important for your message, what the main theme of your piece will be and how the figures will support that. That will also help you to decide what figures should go in a paper and what should go in the supplementary information. When you're writing and it comes to writing your piece, be really clear. Try to be as accurate but concise as you possibly can. So try to use active language. Now, what do I mean by that? That's kind of, instead of being very convoluted and very descriptive and very passive, where you just describe everything that you did and all the things that um, it could be, um, try, to, try to shorten it. Try to focus on the main point, be active. We did something and this is what we found. So try and keep it um, active and short. And the active language tends to naturally be shorter as well and easier to follow. And also make sure that you're specific. Uh, being concise does not mean um, that you're not specific. So if you're talking about cells, tell me what cells they are. If you're talking about the RAS oncogene, tell me which RAS you mean. Do you mean KRAS? Do you mean NRAS? Try to be as specific and as accurate as you can. These things are also incredibly important when we're thinking about reproducibility and for people to be able to understand uh, the reasoning of um, and the and the logic of your ideas. So um, science in particular is highly, highly focused on accessibility because we have such a broad audience, because the, aud the audience is often um, a non-scientist. Um, we need to be accessible. We need to make sure that what we publish can be understood. And that's particularly the case for any commentary or reviews as well. So writing accessibly does not mean dumbing down. It doesn't mean that you need to gloss over things and not really explain things properly. You need to focus on how what the important things are to make your points, to make the logic of your ideas easy to follow from by anybody and that often means that the things that you take for granted that you already know the basic background information um, need to be explained because you need to remember that most people who read your work are not experts like you are they will not understand the basics so you need to remember to try to point those out and try and explain from the beginning how your ideas have followed also, try to avoid technical terms. Inevitably, I think papers and obviously certain areas more so than others uh, require the use of technical terms. But make sure that you define them when you first use them so people can understand what they are. Um, obviously, always integrate and explain your figures. Um, and a personal pet peeve of mine, and you are welcome to disagree with this, but really try to avoid analogies. Um, I've edited a lot of work in the past 12 years. And I always remember analogies, not because I think they're really good, but quite often because they just make me laugh, but they're not in a helpful way. So I once had a review that had two paragraphs about how cancer is a runaway train that you can't possibly stop. And it went on for two paragraphs of this analogy that really wasn't very helpful. And I think in, in this day and age where we have a lot of uh, word limits and restrictions um, and length limits about what we can what we can say. I really think that analogies are unnecessary and if you've explained your ideas well enough you shouldn't need one anyway. So I would strongly recommend that you don't do this. And also when you're writing, when you read back read it back, check for repetition. Um, you shouldn't need to repeat the same point more than once. It should be, you know, it should be straightforward and clear to only say something once. Although obviously that's easy. Um, so when it comes to actually submitting, 
um, follow the journal instructions and the guidelines. Every journal has its own way of doing things. They have their own guidelines and they have their own rules. Try to follow those as much as you can. Um, when you're writing, think like your audience. Think about the editor who's going to read your paper. Having read 12, 10 or 12 papers that day, they're going to come to your paper. How are they going to assess it? What are they going to think about it? Um, run your own review process. This is really good for both reviews and for papers. Um, consult your colleagues in your department because they can tell you how accurate they think your work is, whether it's how exciting it is for the field, but also ask people outside of your department, people who are not necessarily experts in your field, and ask them what they think. Did they find it interesting? Did they find it easy to follow? Did they find it accessible? Um, and lastly, use a cover letter. Cover letters are really important. They are not for copying and pasting your abstract and saying, I've submitted my paper and this is what it is, and here's the abstract. Use them to tell the editor why your work is important and why it fits the journal. These really don't need to be very long, but it's, really, it's a really helpful way that you can concisely and quickly make an editor aware of why your piece is important and why it fits. Uh, I'm just going to finish if you have any questions for me please feel free to email me on that address you can also find me on Twitter and I try and tweet every week about the kind of the coolest biology that I think we've published and other things that I've seen around that I think are really good um, if you wanted to know more about the journal there's a link there on the sciencemag.org website um, we also have links for information for authors as well as to the portal to submit. So CTS is the online manuscript tracking system. And if you want to submit something, do so through there. And thank you very much for your attention. I hope this has been helpful. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Gam um, Adderton. So uh, question time, please. You can also type your question or you can ask by the audio. Anyone works. Uh, so the floor is open for questions. We have like, I think more than 30 minutes to discuss that. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Adderton. I think I have a um, few questions myself. Okay. So, yeah, sure. So you talked about diversity. Um, I don't know if that diversity acro apply across um, national lines. Like, um, do you have some, um, reviewers in your team or editors in your team that are from different countries across the world, like from low-income countries, from um, Asian and African countries, or is it just diversity across gender lines or, um, so So I, I just want to put more line in that diversity. Is there diversity across um, across national lines? Sure. I mean, that, that's certainly something that everyone is striving for, and we are in particular striving for that. I mean, there's obviously logistics issues in terms of where the offices are based, and science is based in Washington, D.C., but we also have an office in Cambridge in the U.K., um, and we can work um, uh, online and work from home. And so we're certainly trying to expand the scope of both the editors, but also of the board of reviewing editors so they are rotated regularly and we're trying to look further afield because I think science has been very US focused um, particularly for the board and we're trying to expand that considerably but it's also about us being able to get out to different countries and learn about the science and and meet people who we you know who we feel would be um, great members of our board so that's something that we're really focusing on at the moment. Thank you. So how do one apply for um, to be a reviewer? To be a reviewer? Yes. I mean, really, um, if you're interested in being a reviewer, feel free to contact an editor. All of the editor's emails are available on the website if you want to contact them. Um, it's, it's also about if you're at a conference and you see that there is an editor there, go and talk to them. Put yourself on their radar so that they can remember you for reviewing and tell them that you're interested. Um, and that you want to be involved. So feel free to feel free to contact people and and let them know that you want to want to be there. 
Thank you. Um, just one more question too, in case anyone has. Sure. Um, does does the review and perspective follow the normal peer review process? I didn't really get that. Or is it just the decision of the editor when you submit a perspective or review paper? So well, so all all reviews are peer reviewed and they're reviewed by the members of the board as well. Um, the perspectives, if the perspective is on a paper, uh, they are often not peer reviewed, um, partly because of time, but also because they are commentaries on a paper um, and um, so they're not as kind of broad as a, as a standalone type perspective. But the standalone perspectives, which are the two page short summaries of kind of emerging areas in biology, they are almost all reviewed by members of the board and then often they are sent out to external review and that is an editorial decision depending on you know how it goes with the with the members of the board and what the expertise is of the board members as well thank you no problem okay um so someone is asking online yeah and this is a very good question uh, there are many fake predatory journals out there. So he's asking, um, how do we differentiate genuine from fake journals? Yeah, it's a great question. It's really difficult out there. I, I would recommend that you make sure that they have a website. Check for that. Um, if they have a website, they should have contact information and you can ask them. Have a look at what they've published, if they're saying they've published things. And if you see anybody you know, contact them. I mean, I think you have to do some sleuthing in many ways to try and figure out for sure um, what these journals are. But I think, you know, often if they've contacted you, um, then I would be cautious. Oh, so what you mean is original, genuine journals don't send out um, um, like, you know, invitation to submit articles? So, well, so they can do, but they're often kind of, you know, just very generic emails about, you know, this journal is going to launch and um, tell you a bit about it. But sometimes the predatory journals will contact people directly. And I think that is something that happens very rarely um, with a genuine journal. I think you need to be just just try and take things with a pinch of salt. If they feel if they don't seem quite genuine, try and investigate a little bit and see what see what's going on. And consult your colleagues as well and see what they think. Oh, great. So, yeah, I know many people have been um, victims of the predatory journals, I guess, maybe especially from Africa, yeah. those publishing. Yeah. So, please, um, the floor is still open for questions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, someone is asking, this is Emmanuel, is it to what extent do Science journal permits authors to make their publications available to interested readers online, e.g., on research yeah. page. Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you if you're an author and you've published with a science journal, you are welcome to put your article that's accepted the accepted version um, in whichever repository you choose. Often, um, if they are, there are certain ones that require six months before but you can you can post your paper on your website on your department's repositories um and then there are certain rules about the nih and pubmed and that kind of thing so um for that you'd have to refer to the guidelines because it differs and i don't want to give you the wrong information but certainly there is there is um a great deal of freedom in terms of posting the accepted manuscript um on your websites wherever you choose all right. Okay. Nice. More questions. Okay. All right. Um, any more questions, please? Okay. Um, so I don't know um, if this is a um, very appropriate question. Um, how, what would you talk about? Um, which of the natures were you um, a former editor? You know, was uh, I was an editor at Nature Reviews Cancer. 
Nice. Okay. Um, we have a question from, I don't know, can you see the questions? We have one question from, okay. I can see one here about uh, positions of authors. So there's recent discussion about the review on positions of authors in a published paper. Yeah. That's uh, okay. So the recent focus, they should be on impact factor of paper as opposed to positions of authors. I'm not sure I understand that question. <laughs> yeah. Um, hello, Dr. Bayomi. You can actually ask the question straight if your speaker is walking. Okay, I think, um, I don't know, maybe he's not hearing, um, he's not, since speaker is not working. Um, but I think what he's talking about is, okay, all right, he asked again. Okay, this is Adeniji. Please explain impact factor of journals and what it means. Okay, so um, the impact factor uh, is a metric that allows, um, allows you to get an idea of the citation rate for the past two years of a journal. And so what that means is that um, uh, the people that do the, the impact factor um, assess the two years of manuscripts prior to the year of the man, of the impact factor that's assigned. So the, we're doing 2018 impact factors at the moment. So they are based on 2016 and 2017 publications. And they are basically, I mean, no one completely knows exactly how it's worked out, but they are based on the citation uh, per paper and the number of papers that are included in the impact factor. And so anything that's kind of two pages or less usually isn't. Um, the number of other, those articles that are published and the number of citations they receive, and they do a calculation and that gives you the impact factor. So the idea is, is that uh, if you publish um, in a high impact journal, um, impact factor journal, that means that there are likely to be more citations for that paper. But we must remember that um, impact factor is just one measure. And sometimes uh, citations of a paper might actually reflect that it's not a very good paper because it's cited as, a, as an example of data that people don't agree with. And so the citation number for that paper actually isn't reflective necessarily of um, something that is generally thought of in the field as being a good piece of work. Um, whereas other papers, are not cited very much to start with, and then they really get cited a long, um, like five to 10 years later, and they get loads and loads of citations. Um, and so there are real problems with the impact factor because it's certainly not a perfect metric. And that's why um, there's a real uh, direction away from impact factors and closer to out metrics. And out metrics is another way of measuring the quality or the success or the reach of a paper and so that will be a score that's based on kind of social media um, discussion or news coverage or sharing and that kind of thing and so there are now many many different metrics um, that try to give a better spread of of the quality of a paper that goes beyond the impact factor which is um, most people accept is flawed so how, how really do you uh, measure the productivity of um, a researcher or an academician? Um, so, well, I mean, so we, yeah, I mean, it's not really our job as editors to, yeah. to, to judge um, authors in that way. We only judge what's submitted to us in terms of the work. Um, and obviously whoever submitted it is not um, something that we think about because everything needs to be treated equally depending you know regardless of who's submitted so um, certainly when I'm looking at reviewers or thinking about authors I make a judgment in terms of how authoritative I think someone might be or how insightful they could be um, and I will use you know what they've published where they've published whether I've seen them at a conference um, whether they've really made me think differently about something in what they've written or what they've spoken about and I try and use that kind of thing. Um, but, but certainly editors, it's not, it's not our role at all to make judgments about um, the quality of an author. 
per se. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Um, any more questions? Okay. Uh, all right. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Adam T. And then, um, my pleasure. yeah, in the absence of questions, I think we may just come to the end of the class. Oh, um, someone asked, do many journals request for cover letters? Uh, yes, most most um, journals will expect to see a cover letter of some sort. Um, and I really think that they are a great way of conveying, you know, the most important points about your paper to an editor to get their attention. So don't make it really long, but but do use them. I think they're really useful. If you imagine how many papers editors read in a day and then in a week and then in a month, you know, a nicely a nicely framed cover letter that's just on one page can be really, really helpful. Thank you. Okay, so so one more question, which may be um, based on your previous experience at Nature. So for Nature Review yeah. Cancer, um, is does Nature Review Cancer just publish reviews or do they publish original research? So uh, Nature Reviews Cancer only publishes reviews. It's only secondary content. So it will be short reviews and opinionated reviews or very long reviews, but it's only ever reviews. It's never primary research. Oh, great. So well, what was the acceptance and rejection rates with Nature Reviews Cancer like? Um, uh, well, so most of the content at Nature Reviews Cancer is commissioned by the editors, and there are three editors that run that journal. Um, and because of the way nature reviews works where there's a lot of editing that happens before peer review the reject rate is very low um so it was something like i think when i started it was something like uh five percent in 2006 now that did rise to about 15 percent even of commissioned content um in 26 uh, 17 when i left um and that's because we we were finding that people were writing uh, lot, a lot longer. So we were getting kind of 9,000 word reviews and they're supposed to be 6,000 and then we were finding there's a lack of synthesis or a lack of insight in the piece and you know we can, I can, as an editor I can help with organisation and narrative flow and how you write something to make it be understood clearly but when it comes to kind of really scientific insight and what you want to say as an author that's not something I can help with so the, the reject rate increased um, before I left, unfortunately, um, but yeah, it's 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 pretty it's still pretty low though, it's still about fifteen percent, something like that. Yeah. So, but that that's definitely um, low compared to, or right, rather, it's high. The okay, the acceptance rate is going to be low compared to. I know there's one other sister nature journal, Nature Clinical Oncology, something like that, that publish oncology yeah. research. Okay, yes. that, one, that one is focused on just the um, original articles. No, so Nature Reviews Clinical Oncology is also a reviews journal. So there are 17 reviews journals and there's Nature Reviews Clinical Oncology and Nature Reviews Cancer. And cancer covers um, uh, cancer biology and kind of preclinical work and Nature Reviews Oncology covers translational side of cancer research and the oncology side and the clinical trial side of things. That's kind of roughly how it's supposed to split between the two. Okay, so if I have an original research um, that is not a review, but something I have worked, maybe a clinical trials or something, in which of them do I publish it? So you would have to go to a, a primary journal for that. So something like um, Nature Medicine or that kind of, that kind okay. of uh, journal with a translational um, focus. All right. Thank you. Or obviously much. any of the clinical journals as well that publish yeah. those. Okay. Thanks. I think um, in the absence of any more question, we just came to the end of the class. Thank you very much, Dr. Adderton. We really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you very much. Right. Bye. Yeah. Bye.